We'll move on now to Dr. Corolla. Ball, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Can you guys see? Yeah, look, you're in. You're in full screen now. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about anca negative vasculitis, and what that means for my talk is patients who have uh, negative ANCA by IF and, and um, uh, direct antigen testing and who have false immune glomerulonephritis on kidney biopsy. So let's start with the case that I saw at Harborview. So this is a 57-year-old male, uh, history of hypertension, diabetes. He had a TAVR in the past. He presented in August of 2021 with gross hematuria, recurrent epistaxis, intermittent hemoptysis and melena for one month. He did not have other, uh, review of systems was negative for other rheumatological problems. Um, he was hypertensive, uh, but rest of the vital signs were stable. He had clear lungs, no edema, no rash or no synovitis on exam. And these are his labs. He was bit anemic with hemoglobin of 9.7 and his creatinine was 3.84 up from baseline of 0 0.8. He had blood and protein, and, and a lot of the red cells were dysmorphic, and he had 3.7 grams per gram uh, protein area on a spot sample. Uh, imaging study was clean, except for a three millimeter right uh, upper lobe stone on the right side. Complements were normal, except for, sorry, C3 was normal, and C4 was very low, uh, less than eight. Numitoid factor was positive. Uh, albumin was a bit low at 3.2, um, rest of the serological workup was negative and paraprotein workup was negative as well. Uh, ANE, anti-GBM and ANCA was negative both by IF uh, uh, as well as by Bioflex. So uh, given the concern for RPGN, he received three days of uh, IV methylprednisolone and kidney biopsy was performed. And this was his kidney biopsy. You can see uh, the glomerulus uh, being completely destroyed by a cellular crescent. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, tubules with acute tubular injury. And there is a tubule filled with red cells. So this is red cell cast and, and a lot of uh, interstitial inflammation. And this is the IF picture for fibrin. So this is a glomerulus where uh, it's stained trace uh, uh, for fibrin. And then this is a, uh, another picture, but this I got it from, from the internet about C3 which was about trace. So patient had false immune uh, glomerulonephritis. So for the rest of the talk, what I mean by false immune glomerulonephritis is patients who have crescentric GN and IF trace to one plus uh, on immunofluorescence who have negative ANCA both by immunofluorescence as well as by direct antigen testing. So let's talk briefly about the organ system involvement in seropositive ANCA vasculitis. When we think about ANCA vasculitis, we often think of them as small vessel vasculitis, but there's a quite a big range in terms of the vessels that can be involved, all from the arterial level to the venular level. You know, when you have the capillary level involvement, it's often with anti-GBM disease. And, uh, you know, if you think of strict small vessel vasculitis, those are likely, you know, cryo or uh, HSP or, or anti-C1Q vasculitis. And we often classify uh, 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 ANCA vasculitis as GPA, MPA, or EGPA, and all of them have different uh, 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 predilection for different organ system. But, and, and, you know, the classification is very, very fluid and it can change. For example, you know, you can see from this cartoon that kidneys are much more involved by MPA more than GPA and more than EGPA. Let's say if you have a patient who has false immune necrotizing vasculitis and RPGN picture, no other vasculitis involvement, the classification would be RLV, meaning renal limited vasculitis. You wouldn't call it MPA. But let's say if that patient's creatinine is six, has some chest pain, and, and has uremic, uh, signs of uremia, if you're calling the patient as a case of uremic pericarditis with RLV, the classification would still be RLV. But if you think the pericarditis is from vasculitis, the classification would change into MPA. So this classification is very, very fluid. 
and different diseases have different uh, predilection for different organ systems. So, you know, we, we know that a lot of the upper respiratory tract and, and nose and sinuses are much more likely to be involved with GPA. GPA is much more likely to cause lung nodules, cavitations, and granulomas. EGPA is much, much more likely to cause granulomas, asthma, and eosinophilia. Uh, in this picture, you can see that there is a, a nasal septal destruction, destruction of the inferior and middle turbinate. This is a case of GPA. And on the figure on the, the, the imaging on the right, you can see newborn formation after bone destruction in the case of GPA. This is uh, another uh, uh, imaging chest x-ray of a patient with pulmonary hemorrhage, which is much more common in MPA. And this is uh, the CT scan of a patient with, with pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, much more recently, you know, more than classifying diseases as you know, EGPA, GPA, or MPA, it's much more important to classify them as whether they are seropositive or seronegative, as that has much more implications than, than the the, the distant, uh, different disease states themselves. So we know that PR3 anchor vasculitis tends to have much more aggressive picture and is much more likely to relapse. And anterior anchor vasculitis can have a smoldering process and, and more fibrosis on imaging. So as far as the kidney involvement is concerned, you know, it's much more common in MPA more than GPA, more than EGPA. Um, and, and, and so is RPGN. But when you look at uh, uh, figure B, you know, MPA patients are much more likely to have higher creatinine and proteinuria. The reason is when you biopsy them, you are more likely to see more fibrotic changes. And then these are the four different pictures uh, uh, of patients with ankyovasculitis. The first one is a patient who has a, a small crescent, a cellular crescent involving, you know, 10 to 20% of a glomerulus. B is a patient who has crescent involving most of the glomerulus. C is a patient who has a small fibrous crescent. And D is a globally glomerulus theoretic uh, uh, glomerulus. And these things are important because they have prognostic implications in seropositive ankyovasculitis. So if you see a glomerulus with more than 50% globally sclerotic glomeruli, you call it sclerotic class. If you see more than 50% normal glomeruli in a sample, you call it focal class. And if you see more than 50, and, and let's say if you have a sample of 20 glomeruli and more than 10 or more than 50% have crescents, then you call it crescentric crest. And if you have less than 50% of any of these, you call it mixed class. And this has prognostic implications in seropositive ankyovasculitis. So if you look at renal survival, it's much more higher in focal class compared to sclerotic class, not surprising. So at, at, at five years, the renal survival is 93% as opposed to 51% in, in sclerotic class. And then precentric and mixed classes have survival in between. And, and more recently, there was a paper that they, they, their renal survival may be, may be similar. Now let's move on to ANCA testing. So as far as ANCA testing is concerned, you know, the first thing we often think about is immunofluorescence, where we fix the neutrophils. So neutrophils can be fixed with formalin where uh, these neutrophilic granules, which have uh, MPO or, or PR3, can be seen in the cytoplasm, and then this, the nucleus would be separate. So if you stain that for, if the nucleus, uh, if, if there's nucleus staining on formalin fix, fixation, that's often ANA positive. But when you add ethanol to neutrophils, what happens is that this, uh, the, the positively charged MPO flocks towards the nucleus, which is negatively charged. So you get a P anchor or perinuclear anchor pattern. So P anchor is really, it's an, it's an artifact where you're, you, you're causing it by adding uh, ethanol. And then that in turn causes the, the, the positively charged particles to move towards the nucleus. So let's say if you just add ethanol to uh, a, a neutrophil in a patient with lupus, you know, the lupus patient may have P anchor positivity, which would be a false positive. So in that case, you'd, you'd fix neutrophils both in ethanol and, 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 and um, formalin to differentiate between ANA positivity versus PNK positivity. And the granules that are weakly cationic or neutral proteins such as PR3 stay in the cytoplasm and you call it a CNK pattern. We know that 90% you know, of GPA patients have ANCA positivity by IF and 
when you do direct antigen testing, up to 90% are PR3 positive. In MPO, most commonly, not, you know, 90% of them have ANCA, and more than 90% of them have MPO. In renal limited vasculitis, 90% of them are ANCA positive, and up to 80% have MPO. Uh, in EGP, up to 30 to 50% are ANCA positive, and it's most likely MPO more than PR3. And and EGPA with GN involvement, if you have glomerulonephritis involvement, they're more likely to have ANCA positivity. ANCA negative disease tends to cause more uh, cardiac disease or neurological disease. So you can see this IF picture of a patient with PR3 ANCA vasculitis. There's like the chromatin is condensed um, and, and, and PR3. The second pattern is a patient with atypical PR3 because the, the PR3 is more widespread. C is a patient who has uh, 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 P anca uh, because it's perinuclear. And D is a patient uh, who has IF positive both for uh, P anca as well as C anca. So MPO and PR3 are not only the antigens present in, in neutrophils, there are tons of other antigens such as elastase, cathepsin G, azurocytin, lactoferrin, lysozyme, BPI. They have different functions in neutrophils. Most of these atypical antigens either have a PNK pattern or they have a mixed pattern on IF. And as far as testing the, 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 the ANCA antigens, uh, you know, the two most commonly employed methods are the ELISA or Bioflex. Um, in terms of ELISA, you know, we've kind of moved uh, this technique has really evolved from direct ELISA all the way to anchor ELISA. So in di direct ELISA, PR3, the antigen is, is uh, attached to the plastic and then to which is, is attached, uh, and then you add patient serum and then you add the secondary antibody. The problem of directly attaching PR3 is that you tend to lose some epitopes. So this is less sensitive. And then this technique kind of evolved into capture ELISA where you add a monoclonal antibody to which the antigen is attached. And then you have the patient serum and then have a secondary antibody. And anchor ELISA is where you add a bridging molecule which is attached to the antigen. So more epitopes can, are, are available for, for antibody binding. So anchor ELISA is, is more sensitive than direct ELISA. The way we measure ANCA at UW is with Bioflex where you add a sample uh, and then you add these magnetic beads with us, which are coated with specific antibody for analytes. Then you have biotinylated antibody to which you add strep avidin, which is coated with picoerythrin. And then you pass it through uh, a flow and, and, and a laser beam uh, detects uh, the bead. One laser beam detects the bead, whereas the other one detects the concentration of picoerythrin. So more, more binding there is, and, and uh, you know, that's how you, you detect the, the concentration of uh, antibody. And this has a specificity of 95% um, and, and has a sensitivity of 89% for GPA and 92% for MPA. And um, as far as the, the nomenclature, how you should be testing for ANCA, this has kind of evolved from 1999 all the way to 2017. You know, previously, you know, the, it, could, it used to be a two-step process where you first do IF, and and then you know, and then you do you know direct antigen testing. So um, you know you could have IF positive, ANCA negative, or IF positive, ANCA positive. But in the 2017 consensus, you first do a gating strategy where you know based on the pretest probability of having ANCA vasculitis, like an RPG in picture, retroorbital mass, only hemorrhage, you you directly do uh, antigen testing by either Bioflex or, or by third generation ELISA. So you could either be ANCA negative and ANCA positive, but if you have a very high pretest probability of, of having ANCA, ANCA vasculitis, even if they're ANCA negative, then you do a second assay. Um, um, and they do not usually recommend uh, ANCA testing by, the, at least based on the 2017 consensus, it's not recommended to do IF. And this comes from this study from Europe. So this is a UVAS cohort of patients with ANCA vasculitis, 186 GPA, 65 MPA, 924 controls, who had other rheumatological disease, but no ANCA vasculitis. And these patients were not on immunosuppression at the time of sampling. 
And as you, as you can see from the ROC curve, sensitivity versus one minus specificity, all of these curves on the right side are direct, are direct antigen testing, either through third generation ELISA or Bioplex. This gray curve is the curve of no discrimination. These two curves, the, the green one and the blue ones are immunofluorescence. The blue one is immunofluorescence on ethanol fixed sample. And the green one is immunofluorescence on both formalin and ethanol fixing. So you can see when you do it on both formalin and ethanol fixing, you do gain some specificity and sensitivity, but this does not compare, you know, compared to direct antigen testing. So that's why many labs just do ANCA testing directly and they, they don't even bother to do IF. I mean, IF still has some advantages, like you know, you can see if there's an atypical ANCA, ANCA pattern. And and but then, you know. The only two, two common antigens that we test are MPO and PR3, and we don't usually do testing for atypical antigens outside of the research realm. And in this study, the overall uh, air, the accuracy for immunoassay was 0.922, and number four is the one that we use at UW where the accuracy was 0.947. And in this study, at least uh, 11 to 17 percent were, were ANCA negative by IF and 9 to 16% were uh, negative by immunoassay. So let's talk about uh, baseline characteristics of ANCA negative vasculitis. Uh, there aren't a lot of studies in ANCA negative vasculitis. These are the only uh, six of them. And, and the earliest study was from 2000, it was a UK population-based study where they had 27% ANCA negative as opposed to 73% ANCA positive. And ANCA negative had lower prevalence of upper respiratory involvement. The second study from 2005 is from France, where they uh, uh, talked about 20 ANCA negative patients, and they had lower prevalence of ENT involvement. The third study is from Taiwan in 2006, uh, that compared 36% of ANCA negative as opposed to 60% ANCA positive, and they had lower prevalence of systemic involvement, 26 versus 72%. The Jason study is from 2007. It's uh, from China, single center. Again, had only few patients, 28 versus 57. So 37, 33% ANCA negative as opposed to 67% ANCA positive. And they had lower prevalence of constitutional symptoms and lung involvement. The 2016 paper is from the United States, 23% ANCA negative versus 77% ANCA positive. And uh, at least in the United States paper, the prevalence of constitutional symptoms were similar the paranasal and ENT were, was less common in ANCA negative, whereas the lung involvement was uh, lung nodules, cavitations, infiltrates were similar compared to ANCA positive patients. The largest study was published in 2022. It's from France, single center. They did not have EM data. They only had light microscopy and IF data. And they had 57% with primary ANCA negative vasculitis and some patients also had infection-induced ANCA and, and cancer-induced ANCA. And, and, and it seemed that a lot of these ANCA-negative patients had less constitutional involvement, less extramural involvement, less skin-lung uh, involvement. And, and almost all of them had, 100% uh, of them had renal involvement. And, and uh, uh, just to go over these studies, uh, red is ANCA-negative vasculitis, uh, blue is ANCA-positive vasculitis. You can see the percentage of females, most of them had at least 40% females, except for the second study uh, from France where they had only 25% females. Uh, the, the Chinese cohort and the Taiwanese cohort were much younger, like 37, 39 and 45, but most of the other cohorts were older, you know, 60 to 70 years old. This is where we also diagnose ANCA positive vasculitis. Uh, the admission creatinine was you know uh, uh, between four to five, but but the first cohort uh, uh, from from the UK had much higher creatinine. The study from uh, from United States by Shaw at all did not have uh, admission creatinine. They had their GFR, and it was, uh, the the eGFR was lower in the ANCA negative group, seventeen on admission. And ANCA negative patients had much higher uh, level of proteinuria compared to ANCA positive patients. And, and, and what I haven't shown is a lot of them had nephrotic means proteinuria as well. And um, 
you know, most studies showed that at least 20 to 40 percent of them needed dialysis on admission. The first uh, in the first study, up to 56 percent of ANCA negative patients needed dialysis on presentation. As far as the histology is concerned, um, you know, 29 to 39 percent of them had normal glomeruli. Um, you know, up to uh, uh, closer to 40 to 70 percent of them had crescents on examination. The, the, the study from France, which is the largest, you know, up to 96 percent of them had crescents. Um, you know, up to 20 to 20 percent of them had global glomerulosclerosis. The study from Taiwan, 62 percent had glomerulosclerosis. Um, uh, most of them, up to 50% of them, had tubular interstitial fibrosis on biopsy. The first study in 2005, up to 80% of them had fibrosis. Tubular atrophy was, was present in up to 37% in the study from, from Taiwan, but up to 93% uh, in the study from China. We don't have information about that uh, from, the, from the American as well as French cohort. And this is a study uh, uh, which was published in 2005 where they compared the histology between ANCA negative and UVAS cohort. So this is a European study. So you can see ANCA negative versus MPO positive and PR3 positive vasculitis from the UVAS cohort. And when you look about glomerular lesions, the, the white is normal, um, uh, gray is uh, crescents, and, and black is glo glomerular sclerosis. You can see they had more glomerular sclerosis compared to PR3 ANCA positive vasculitis. There was really no difference between MPO and ANCA negative patients, but, but ANCA negative patients had more global glomerular sclerosis compared to PR3. And they also had more severe interstitial fibrosis compared to PR3 ANCA positive vasculitis. The, the fibrosis between ANCA negative and MPO positive patients was similar. As far as the treatment is concerned, you know, most of these patients uh, in these cohorts were treated with steroids, often in com combination with cytoxan. And the later cohorts also had patients up to 90% 9 treated with rituximab. Phoresis was used in up to 27% of the patients, especially in the earlier cohorts. And the most common agent used for maintenance was azathioprine. And up to 2 to 6% of these uh, patients did not undergo any treatment, and, and the likely reason was thought to be due to more fibrosis uh, on biopsy. One of the reasons why ANCA negative patients don't do well is that they have a delay in diagnosis and, and, and on biopsy have more, more fibrosis. And some patients had IVIG and Bactrim for induction. As far as the outcomes is concerned, uh, you know, up to 40% of them uh, reached ESRD. Uh, you know, the incidence of ESRD in seropositive ANCA vasculitis is about 25 to 28%, so slightly higher than in ANCA positive vasculitis. Uh, they had up to 20% relapse rates. Renal, you know, most of the patients did end up uh, reaching renal remission, at least in the later cohorts, it was up to 90, 91 to 94%. And uh, there were up to 40% uh, total deaths, at least in some cohorts, and, and the most likely common cause of death was infection, uh, cardiovascular disease, and, and, and relapse of vasculitis. And, and, and uh, uh, this is the GFR at last, at last cohort. This is the American cohort from 2016, where the GFR was uh, 59. And the French cohort, the EGFR was 41 at last follow-up. And most, in most studies, the glomerular histology at diagnostic, diagnosis did not have prognostic significance compared to seropositive ANCA vasculitis, where burden classification was important. And it was thought that because they had less sample size, maybe this was not statistically significant. Uh, need for RRT at diagnosis is at diagnosis and, and vasculitis score dictated overall survival in European cohorts, so more severe vasculitis, worse prognosis. And in most cohorts, the admission creatinine was very important for renal survival, so higher the creatinine, worse renal survival. But only in Asian cohorts, ANCA seropositivity was important for renal survival. It was not replicated in, in the European and American cohorts. Uh, so you can see this is a, a, a Kaplan-Meier curve from European cohorts where you know, need for dialysis and admission was, was important in overall survival, which is also true in ANCA positive vasculitis. This is another uh, Kaplan-Meier curve from 2005 paper where AIDS at diagnosis was important in patient survival, which is also true for seropositive ANCA positive vasculitis where 
seropositive patients tend to do 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 uh, do seropositive patients who are older tend to tend to do worse. And this is a, a, a Taiwanese cohort where the the solid line is the um, seropositive anka vasculitis. The dotted line is the seronegative, and you can see seronegative patients did worse in terms of renal survival, but this was not significant. And this is the Chinese cohort where the seronegative group, which is in solid line, did worse in terms of renal survival. So, so conclusions. So, so number one, is it really not anka vasculitis? I mean, we're calling uh, you know patients who have postimmune necrotizing vasculitis and on IF have either traced one plus staining, and, you know, they're negative by uh, 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 direct, uh, either direct, both by IF and direct antigen testing. So we're calling it vasculitis and grouping it with vasculitis. but is it really not vasculitis? Um, you know, a lot of these studies, I mean, the earliest study that I showed was from 2000 and the, 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 the collected data from 1990 or late 1980s where ANCA testing was not standardized and still not standardized in, in Europe and in the United States. So there could have been a lot of ANCAs that, that have been missed, a lot of false negativity. And then you can see, you know, ANCA testing has also evolved like from first generation ELISA all the way to third generation. And when we look at ANCA vasculitis, you know, we often think of neutrophils as important for pathogenesis where the neutrophils are primed and are activated and they kind of, you know, uh, they're either activated by upregulation up, up of ANCA antigens on their surface to which the ANCA antibodies bind and then they undergo degranulation in a process known as mitosis. But what's also important is the contribution for our, from other part of the immunity, the adaptive arm of immunity, where, you know, uh, CD4 cells uh, can be activated by uh, the, the TS17 cells can themselves secrete IL-17 or interferon gamma, which in turn can activate neutrophils. And CD8 cells can also release cytokines that can activate neutrophils. And these can be independent of uh, ANCA, ant ANCA antibodies. So neutrophils as key players. What I haven't shown you in most studies is that when they did biopsy, they saw neutrophils in glomeruli. So they are definitely involved in pathogenesis. Uh, role of cell-mediated immunity. Uh, Cunningham et al. showed that in, in patients with postimmune necrotizing vasculitis, uh, they do see uh, evidence of CD3 T cells, CD45 uh, RO cells, as well as macrophages on biopsy, and they likely secrete cytokines, which in turn activate neutrophils independent of ANCA. And there are also other antibodies that have been implicated, like anti endothelial cell antibodies, which are present in, in a lot of vasculitis, up to 88% of ANCA positive vasculitis, at least in one paper, up to 53% of ANCA negative vasculitis, which in turn can activate neutrophils. Um, human lysosomal uh, uh, membrane protein 2 anti moiosin antibodies. So, other antibodies may also be involved in the pathogenesis. So, lastly, you know, should we even be using rituximab? If we think of ANCA negative vasculitis as having, you know, if, if B cells are producing ANCAs uh, 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 and, and if, there are, if there's no ANCA that you can detect, should you even be using rituximab? But we know that you know, rituximab is much more than anti-CD20 antibody. So rituximab, you know, depletes CD20 positive B cells, but CD positive, the 20 positive B cells also secrete cytokines, which in turn uh, uh, activate autoreactive T cells. They also cause form, uh, secrete cytokines, which in turn cause formation of short-lived autoreactive plasma cells, which in turn produce antibodies, less so on long-lived long pathogen-specific plasma cells. But also uh, B cells are antigen-presenting cells, and there is this interaction between CD40, CD40 ligand, which can be interrupted when you give rituximab, so there's less uh, uh, CD4 T cell formation also, uh, uh, rituximab uh, blocks the action of monocytes and macrophages, uh, which in turn increases the autocrine activity. So they in turn generate more IL-10 and BAF. So BAF, so rituximab raises BAF levels, which can be uh, problematic in some diseases like, like lupus, where higher BAF levels cause more B cells reconstitution. And lastly, rituximab also increases the expression of T-regulatory cells, which in turn would dampen the inflammation. 
so back to our case. So this is a patient. Uh, so uh, when he first uh, presented, um, you know, uh, he was given uh, a methylprednisolone for three days and he got rituximab. He was discharged on prednisone, but he stopped taking his prednisone and his pradnine shot up. So he was readmitted for reinduction and he required renal replacement therapy for some time. He got another uh, gram of rituximab around this time. And uh, after that, he had issues with his uh, uh, aortic valve. So he was uh, readmitted to Montlake. He had to have valve and valve, um, uh, 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 a valvuloplasty, which in turn delayed his maintenance rituximab. So he just recently uh, received his uh, maintenance rituximab infusions. So to summarize, uh, anchor-negative vasculitis has predominant kidney involvement. Extra renal manifestations in most studies were less common. They had more proteinuria compared to seropositive anchor vasculitis, more nephrotic veins proteinuria. And there, most studies showed that there are more chronic changes on biopsy, and this is very likely the reason why they didn't do well in aging cohorts. Uh, polymorphonuclear cells were central to pathogenesis, but T cells and other antibodies are likely to be involved. And at least in aging cohort, the renal prognosis was, was worse, but but in, in other cohorts, the renal prognosis was as good as anchor positive patients. So I'd like to thank uh, Leah and Matt for uh, their input uh, regarding my slides, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Abal. Perhaps time for one question. Abal, I'll ask the question. So. You, you posed the question to us, is this really vasculitis? Should we be lumping these diseases together? What is your answer to that? I think, I mean, you know, the, the, the methods that we use are still uh, old. Like, you know, we're kind of, this is just based on how they look under the microscope. You know, if they have trace to one plus staining, you know, you don't see um, uh, immunoreactants on IF you're calling it immune necrotizing vasculitis and you're grouping it. But I think as we get to know more and more about the pathogenesis, I think we'll kind of start to separate out things. Like, like for example, for membranous, I mean, you know, we're no longer causing, calling it primary or secondary, we're calling PLA2 or positive, NL1 positive. I think eventually we'll, we'll kind of regroup them based on their pathogenesis rather than how they look under the microscope. Great, thank you so much.